Hi, welcome back to class. It's good to see everybody. So, why am I showing you puppies? Well, first of all, I'm a huge dog lover. Second of all, puppies are awesome and great to look at. And, uh, but most importantly, we're going to talk a lot today in class about uh, coat color determination in animals. And I'll come back to talking about puppies uh, a little bit later and look back at these same puppies. Um, okay, so I just wanted to first of all remind you about where we are in the class. Um, we Last week we covered Mendelian genetics and we talked about applications of probability in genetics. But today we're going to start talking about extensions of uh, Mendelian genetics. But if you have any questions remaining about uh, the material that we covered last week, please make sure you get your questions answered. Either um, come talk to me after class or get the material online that you need. So from the first part of lecture today, you should understand about uh, the extensions of Mendelian inheritance that deal with actions of single genes. And ultimately, you should be able to apply that understanding of that to uh, solving problems that deal with uh, this and predicting the outcomes of crosses that deal with these uh, single gene uh, traits. So last week, when we talked about Mendel's findings with his pea plant experiments, we talked about that how many genes determine a single trait. One. Good, good. One gene determines a single trait in Mendel's experiments. And how many alleles per gene did Mendel deal with in his P experiments? Two. Two, good. So he dealt with two alleles per gene, and he, in each case he was dealing with one allele being completely dominant over the other allele. For example, in the crosses where he was crossing smooth seeds with wrinkled seeds, the smooth seed allele was completely dominant over the wrinkled allele. And in addition to that, um, he also found equal viability of all alleles in these crosses. So none of the alleles affected viability. And what we'll talk about today actually is uh, a number of different variations on this theme where um, you see cases where each of these four um, items do not hold true. So this round versus wrinkled P-shape example brings up a really important um, example of um, a point that I want to make for the rest of the semester, which is really, really key for you to hold in mind the whole rest of the semester. And that is that um, genes that Mendel talked about encode proteins, which then carry out really important functions in the cell which determine the phenotype of the cell. So in 1990, the gene that um, determines whether peas are round or wrinkled was actually identified. And it was found to encode an enzyme called SBE1, which um, is involved in making branch starch molecules. When you're homozygous recessive for this allele, you actually cannot make branch starch. And then if you're a pea plant, you end up with wrinkled seeds as a result of that. So again, it's this idea that a gene encoding an enzyme is determining the phenotype here. So another great example of this kind of thing is the determination of flower color in uh, four o'clocks. In these plants, an enzyme that actually is involved in making red, red pigment in the plants uh, is encoded by a different R gene in this case. And um, if you're homozygous for big R, big R, you make um, two doses of the pigment producing enzyme, and so you end up with red flowers. If, on the other hand, you're homozygous for little r, little r, you don't make any of the pigment producing enzyme, and you uh, don't make any pigment, you end up with white flowers. On the other hand, if you're a heterozygote, you actually make only a single dose of the pigment producing enzyme and you make half as much of the uh, enzyme itself and half as much of the red pigment and therefore you end up with pink flowers. The thing that's, uh, one of the things that's really interesting about this that makes another point 
uh, related to these extinctions of Mendelian inheritance generally, and that is um, that the phenotypic ratios are often different than the kind of ratios that Mendel saw. And in this case, the phenotypic ratio actually mirrors the genotypic ratio since the um, heterozygotes have their own phenotype. This uh, example of the four clocks is a perfect uh, example of the principle that we call incomplete dominance, in which the phenotype of the heterozygote is actually intermediate between the phenotype of the two homozygotes. Uh, so this is the first of our extensions of uh, Mendel for single genes. Two other of these extensions are uh, illustrated by the genetics of ABO blood type determination. And those are uh, the idea that some genes have more than two alleles, and um, there are uh, some genes that, that uh, illustrate the principle of codominance. So in the case of ABO blood type determination, there are three alleles that determine what sort of ABO antigens are found on the surface of red blood cells. The uh, three alleles are the IA allele, the IB allele, and the H allele. And um, in the case of the IA allele, it converts an antigen known as the H antigen into the uh, A antigen. The IB allele converts the H antigen into a B antigen, and uh, the I, little i allele is a, essentially a non-functional allele of this I gene, which doesn't convert the H antigen into either of these two, and actually the H antigen remains uh, as is. So to get back into the biochemistry of this just a little bit, the H antigen is actually a chain of sugars that are added onto some proteins on red blood cells. And um, the A and B alleles of the I gene encode two different glycosyl transferases, which are enzymes that add sugars onto the um, H antigen that you started out with. But the A and the B add different sugars to that H antigen to give you slightly different sugar chains and slightly different antigens on your red blood cells. So, <clears throat> first of all, that illustrates the idea that um, some genes have more than two alleles. But second of all, it also illustrates um, the idea that um, in some cases genes are not strictly dominant or recessive, but uh, or even incomplete dominant, but actually are um, co-dominant. And so the way this works in blood type is, if you're little i, little i genotype, you have only the H antigen on your uh, red blood cells and your type O blood. The, if you are little uh, big i, uh, sorry, IA, IA, or IA, little i, then you express only the A antigen on your red blood cells and your type A blood. If similarly, if your type, uh, if your IB IB or IB little i, then you make only the B antigen on your red blood cells, and you have type B blood. Um, finally, if you are uh, a heterozygote for the IA and IB alleles, because both of those alleles are functional, you can actually make both of those types of glycosyl transferase enzymes and make both types of antigens. So you actually end up with the A antigen and the B antigen on your red blood cells and your type AB blood in that case. This illustrates the principle of codominance because in this case heterozygotes express the product of both of the alleles. So you're expressing the product of the IA allele and the IB allele. So uh, this gets us through incomplete dominance, multiple alleles, and codominance. So you should understand from incomplete and codominance that uh, the dominance or recessiveness of an allele is not inherent in the allele itself, but det is determined by how it's interacting with other alleles. And you should understand that some genes have multiple alleles. So to understand the uh, further examples that we'll talk about today, uh, you need to understand a little bit more about uh, uh, coat color determination in animals. 
And uh, so the first of the genes that we'll talk about involved in coat color determination is called the extension locus. The extension locus, uh, if you have a dominant allele for the extension locus, then you have, uh, you can make dark colored fur. If you're homozygous recessive for the extension locus, you make either uh, reddish or yellowish fur. So the extension locus encodes a receptor protein called the MC1R receptor protein that's found on the surface of um, pigment producing cells. And this MC1R uh, protein is a seven pass transmembrane receptor that binds to a hormone that we'll call MSH. When the MSH hormone binds to the receptor, it triggers a downstream signaling pathway that leads to the production of brown or black pigment known as eumelanin. So what do you think happens if you have uh, a recessive allele and you can't make the functional receptor? Uh, you don't get brown or black. Exactly. You can't make the brown or black pigment and in fact you make an alternate pigment, pigment called pheomelanin which leads to the yellow or red fur color. Um, so one other gene that's involved in this process that we need to think about is this uh, gene that encodes something called the agouti signaling peptide. And agouti signaling peptide blocks the binding of the hormone to the receptor leading to the production of pheomelanin. In wild type mice, this happens in a pulse during hair development so that you end up with a banded pattern of uh, pheomelanin and eumelanin in the hair uh, shaft. If you're little a, little a, where you can't make any of this agouti signaling peptide, then you uh, actually don't end up with the banding pattern. Many other alleles of the agouti gene also exist, and this is where we'll go next. Um, so, some genes that have multiple alleles exhibit what's called a dominant series, and in a dominant series, uh, one allele can actually be dominant to other alleles and recessive to some alleles. So in this case, if you cross an agouti homozygous mouse with uh, a mouse that's homozygous for this allele called black and tan, where they have black backs and yellow bellies, then uh, all the progeny from that cross are agouti. If you cross an agouti mouse with a black mouse, again, all the progeny from that cross are agouti. But if you cross a uh, black and yellow mouse with a strictly black mouse, now you get all black back, yellow bellied mice. So what I'd like for you to think about is uh, just for a minute, sit down at your seats in your own, uh, at your own chair and order the dominance series for yourself. Figure out which allele is most dominant, which is in the middle, and then which is the least dominant allele. So take a minute and do that, and then I'll check back with you. All right, what'd you come up with? Which allele is the most dominant? Uh, the agouti allele. Absolutely, the agouti allele, good job. And what do you think is the least dominant of the three alleles? The black allele? Yeah, good job, the black allele. And we know that because the black and tan allele is dominant over the black allele. So if you were to write the um, dominant series for this, you would put the agouti allele most dominant, then the um, black and tan allele, and then ultimately the black allele last. All right, so now you should understand incomplete, codominance, multiple alleles, and dominant series. And I want to leave you for this part of the lecture uh, thinking about these puppies again and think about how it is that you can get black chocolate and yellow lab puppies all from a single litter. And also think about what colors the parents must have had in their fur. And uh, we'll come back after the break and we'll address that question because it'll bring us to how uh, multiple different genes can affect a single phenotype.